All right, let's look at the binomial model. Binomial model. This is a discrete model, a discrete time model of, of asset prices. So I'm gonna draw some circles first. One, two, three, four. All right, at initial time, you have some asset price S after one time, it'll either go up or down, so those are the only possibilities in the model, by a factor of u up, so this will go to su, or a factor of v down, so this will go to sv. After another time step, it can go up or down again. So here if it goes up again, you'll get su squared, or suv, because it went up then down, and here it can go down then up, you'll also get suv, and here from sv, you'll get SV squared, if you go down again. And you just keep doing this, making the lattice bigger. And so you get SU cubed, SU squared V, SUV squared, SV cubed. So this is our, our model of the asset. We have U and V for the factors that the asset goes up or down every discrete time step. Let's draw a little time step. This is a delta T. So each discrete time step, the asset can only go up or down. And because u times v is the same as v times u, it's just property of multiplication, this will be a recombining tree, which just means that up down is the same as down up, and it becomes this nice regular lattice. All right, also in the model, Draw a little zoom in diagram here. So also in the model we have probability. So we have S and then we have S times U, S times V. Going up will be probability P and down will be one minus P. Now the question is, how do we uh, choose S, oh no. We wanna choose U, V, and P to match the log normal. What was that? DS equals mu S DT plus sigma S DX. So that's log normal, just a reminder. So how do we choose U, V, and P to match log normal stock behavior? And this is not going to be an exact match. Like this is a discrete time model, and the log normal is continuous time. But we want the limit as our delta t goes to zero to match the log normal behavior. And so what we have to do is match the expected change in s at each time step and we have to match the variance. And so how do you do this? Well, you can, you have three, un three unknowns here and you have a couple equations you're, you're trying to satisfy. So there's multiple ways to do this. So one way you can do this is to choose u equals one plus sigma root delta t and v equals one minus sigma root delta t. Then choose p equals half plus mu delta square root delta t over two sigma. And so with these choices here, we can verify the, the change, I should say the expected change. In S. So what's the expected change of S? So we have the probability of going up and then one minus P is gonna be the probability of going down. Multiply by U to go up, multiply by V to go down. What's the expected value over one time step delta T? So the expected value will be P times 
if you go up, you'll get S times U. Then what about if you go down? It'll be one minus P probability. And what do you get? S times V. So this is the expected new value. And if we subtract off the original value, this will be the expected change in S. And so we can work out some math here. And I'm not gonna write it all out, but if you, if you work out the math, plug in P, U, and V here, you get S mu delta T. And then if you look at the log normal equation, so you look up here and then down here, and you think, oh yeah, that makes sense. So we, the expected change in S over a small uh, delta T is consistent with the log normal random walk. And then you can, you can do a similar calculation for the variance. You, you figure out what's the expected variance of S in one small time step and work out the math and you, you get something that's the, the same as the variance of the log normal random walk. Okay, so here's a good choice for our U, V, and P. How do we actually find an option? How do we price an option? So let's draw a couple diagrams. I'm just drawing a lattice again. And I'm gonna draw another one over here. And so one of, the one on the left is gonna be the asset prices and the one on the right is gonna be the option values. So let me label these, this is asset and this is the option. And to make things concrete, let's, let's pick some, some values. So I'm gonna pick S equals 100 to start out with. Um, our strike price is also gonna be 100. So just at the money, uh, U, do the calculation, we get, oh wait, I have to pick my delta T. And so I have one, two, three steps. I'm just gonna say that delta T is a third. So the option expires in one time unit and we're just dividing it into three chunks. And we'll pick a interest rate of 10% and we have to pick our parameters. So mu is 0.2 and sigma is 0 0.2. All right, so these are just the parameters for an example, so we can write some actual numbers in. And we can calculate u equals 1.1155, if I didn't screw up. And v is 0.8845. So I'm just plugging into these formulas up here. And now, we can fill out our asset lattice here. So what is it? It's 100 to start with. Then if you go up, this will be multiplied by U. So you'll get 115.55. Uh, and if you go down, you multiply by V and you get 88.45. And then you do these again. So if you multiply again by U up here, you get uh, 124.45, 43, and 98.67, if I can read my own handwriting, and 78.24. I'm probably making math mistakes here. Uh, this is just an example, so if I screwed up, leave a comment, but hopefully it won't be too confusing. So here's multiply by U again, it goes up to 138.79. Multiply here by V, you get 110.06. And here 87.27, 69.21. All right, so here I'm just multiplying by U and V and filling out the, the lattice. So the stock starts at 100, Depending on what happens, if it keeps going up every time step, it'll end up at 138. If it goes down every time step, it'll end up at 69. So this, this makes sense. And if it goes up, down, down, it'll end up at 87.27. So we have our little lattice that we can you know, describe the stock price. Now we can fill out the option lattice. 
So at expiration, if the stock is 138.79 and the strike is 100, the value of the option at expiration over here will be 38.79. If the stock is at 110.06, at 100 for the strike price, it'll be 10.06. And then if we got unlucky and it went down, the option will be worth zero and zero here. So here's the payoff of the option at expiration on the right side of the, the option lattice. Now the, the question is, how can we work backwards to get an option price in the present over here on the left? And that's, that's the essence of uh, you know, solving the binomial model here. So how do you do it? So what we have to do is, I'll do a little zoom in again. And so we have here the option price today. And over here we have two possible option prices tomorrow. There's the plus, the, the higher option price, and the lower option price. And the question is, given V plus and V minus, and we know the U's and the V's and the probabilities, how do we work backwards and calculate V? And so you might be tempted to say, well, it's the expected value given the probability between these, and you just work out the expected value. But that's wrong. So remember, we did we talked about this, how even in the simple two-world model, you can't use the regular probability and get an expected value, you'll get the wrong price for the option. You have to use the risk neutral probabilities. And this is sort of counterintuitive, but it gives you the right answer for option pricing. And so what's the risk neutral prob probability? So let's write that. So the risk neutral probability, let's call that P prime. That's going to be like P. So what was P? P is a half plus mu root delta T over two sigma. It's going to be pretty similar. It's going to be a half plus R root delta T over two sigma. So it's just like P. Just like P, but mu goes to R. So this is the risk neutral part. We're, we're replacing mu, the drift, with the interest rate. So here's P, we have the, the mu here, and P prime, our risk neutral probability, has the R instead. And so if we use our risk neutral probability, then we can get the risk neutral expected value of, of the option, and we can work back and get a formula for V. So what's our formula for V. So we want to say V equals the risk neutral expected value in the future discounted because we have interest going on. We have to discount it back to the present. So again, we have a delta T time step. So let's, let's work this out. We want to get P prime times V plus plus one minus P prime times V minus. So this will be the expected value of the option in a risk neutral future, then we have to discount it back to the, to the present here. So this is the future expected value, you have to discount it back. That'll be one plus R delta T, Just basic interest. So let me label these. This is the risk neutral expected value on the top. And bottom here is the, the discount factor. All right, so now we have a formula for V. So we have a formula for V given V plus and V minus. And so we no values over here, we can work backwards and solve for V. So we have our little chart over here. We have the payoffs, which we got from the asset prices. Now, knowing these two payoffs, we can work back to here. So if I plug in these numbers into the formula here, and we have P prime, we can, we have all the numbers there, we just get a number for P prime. And we can work backwards here. And I did some calculations, so this should be 
six five. And then using the same formula with 10.06 and zero, you can work backwards to get this one, and that'll be 6.27. Then zero and zero work backwards, and we just get zero. Then we can go another level back. So here and here, we can work backwards and get 19.4. These two work backwards and get 3.96. No, 91. And then finally, we can use these two and work backwards and get 13.44. So I'm probably reading my hand, handwriting wrong or making math mistakes, but the, the point is using the U and V factors, you can work forwards to get the possible asset values in every possible combination of up-down movements here. Then you can get the payoff of the option at expiration, then work backwards all the way back up to the top using this formula with the risk neutral expectation value of the option discounted back in time to the present. And once you've worked all your way back, then here you have your option value. So here's how you solve and value an option using the binomial model. So it's very cool. The tricky thing is you have to use the risk neutral expectation and this is still counterintuitive, but it's starting to make a bit more sense to me. Cool stuff.